it was a little bit different obviously on in, um, for the American tours because um, in Europe that we were kind of already a little bit known and they were kind of more used to that kind of you know complicated progressive music but the tours we had to do in America initially we our first tour was with Black Sabbath you know so and that was a very you know so it, it was like an alien audience and it's like in in, in, in lots of ways we kind of used used our stagecraft from almost the kind of pop days to say, well, if they, if they don't understand the music, we're going to entertain them anyway. I, it, it wasn't kind of spoken about, but it was just like the underlying feeling that you have to sell this. You can't just, you can't be po-faced and, and think they're only going to accept it because they just won't. And this is a host, this is definitely- You didn't discuss that. That was just your, your instincts. Yeah, yeah, we never, never discussed it before or since, actually. It's just, but it's just my feeling was that, you know, we had enough kind of stagecraft that we could actually sell what we were doing, you know, to, to, a, to a potentially hostile audience. And then yeah. I imagine once you actually started more regularly performing for people who liked you, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of those instincts yeah, well, still held. The thing is, on that tour, uh, you know, it, it was, it, let's say, the first part was Black Sabbath, which is like a total metal crowd who, who were not particularly interested, but curious enough that we were performing. And then uh, um, after that tour was finished, we, got the, we offered the first Jethro Tull tour we ever did. And that was a much more amenable audience. And in fact, that was absolutely, I mean, it was a big, it was really a big break. We were managed by the same guy, you know, Terry Ellis at the time. So it, it kind of came together. But um, I mean, they loved us. I mean, Tull loved us just for the fact that, you know, we're probably the best warm up act we, they ever had. And they, and they were they were kind of secure enough in their own, you know, ability to you know they they were never because some some acts were really kind of well you know to the opening you can't have a sound check you can't do this you can't do that you know stay there. Well, you know, they, once they were, once they hear you sound checking, they know. Wait a second, we can't you know let these guys get away with everything because you're so good. Right. Yeah, but but uh, Tull were you know totally supportive and they enjoyed the fact that. The, by the time they came on, the audience was like, you know, totally into everything. So, well, I think you know, yeah. Ian more than a lot of people probably have a you know a real idea about crafting the entire evening from start to finish, and and really yeah. appreciated what you brought to the, to the table there because what a great night yeah, of so. music. Yeah, and it felt that way. It did. Yeah. First of all, uh, thank you for taking the time to do this. The new freehand remix is wonderful it really is uh i feel like it's an achievement <laughs> and noah's video in particular is unbelievable did i know that you've done a lot of the video work on the previous uh releases but uh did you and noah work together on this or did noah kind of just take it and run no he took it and run he, he ran rather so yeah no he's like um his 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 thing he wanted to do it and you know i i, I kind of put it together after the fact but it's like uh no, it's like you know, I, I won't. I can't take any credit for that. It's, it's all uh, all Noah and, and his and friends of his who who donated other kind of bits and pieces to the uh, to the whole thing. Yeah, there's so many great Easter eggs in this video, and uh, I thought, oh my goodness, Ray really upped his game. You know, going from the, <laughs> the previous release to this one, uh, it was. Then I saw Noah's credit at the end, and I thought, oh my goodness, that's really awesome to see another showman in the family. Taking on the gentle giant, you know, torch. <laughs> no, it Noah uh, also put together the uh, the proclamation fan video, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he's obviously an, an extremely talented guy. <laughs> no, he is. He, he, no, he, that's that's his that's his gig. So it's like you know, but no, my my only really participation, well, apart from but the little bit of performance we did for the proclamation thing, was um, so um, fun. Uh, yeah, he. Uh, he sent me the. He said, um, "Can you can you can I sort out the audio?" Which is like, uh, I think he said there was like a hundred and some something tracks, all and then you know no no there was no click track nothing, you know. Everyone yeah. playing with the original recording, I guess so. Well, and and different recordings as well because we didn't. It, it, if we'd have thought about it, we would have actually even done a beep at the start or or, or given everybody the same one, but it's like. I'm sure everybody had a different source. There were people playing so, with the anyway. live version and stuff. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Well, maybe, but yeah. Anyway, it, it was a little bit of nightmare bits, and but 
anybody. I, yeah, anybody but an that. unbelievable mixing feat, you know, for for him to have done that <laughs> was incredible. And it's musical and it's fun, you know. And then the appearances yeah. from from you guys are just you know precious. It's just wonderful. That video was a game changer. I feel like it it really brought Gentle Giant and its fan base, you know, together in a way that just couldn't have been possible even 10, 15 years ago. You know, YouTube. Oh, that's right. Points, but yeah. Just an unbelievable effort. I suppose, yeah. I suppose one of the only benefits of the uh, lockdown, you know. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, and Mike's uh, locking himself down recording a new album. So, so. Yeah. It, uh, obsessed, you know, but you've got the time to be obsessed. <laughs> Yeah, so after comparing, I sat down last night and A-B'd the original mix with the new Stephen Wilson remix. And it, particularly in On Reflection, you can hear the taiko drum, you can hear the xylophones, like the, the instruments just take this new level of depth. There's way less hiss, there's more isolation. It just sounds like a brand new recording. And uh, I just wanted to hear, like, obviously I didn't spend a decade touring with this music and you know, obsessing over it like you guys did. But what is your experience hearing these remixes? Well, I'm uh, in fairness, I never, I've never, I never listened to us ever, in general. I mean, when, when we when we put these releases together, it's almost like a, an academic exercise. And I usually send send them, you know, because I'm, I'm I'm quite close with Steve, and uh, you know, I, I do his stuff and everything. So um, it's it's like a, when when he sends me the mixes, I always send them on to Kerry. And Derek say, "Yeah, well, listen through, see what you think." Anything, and that, in, in fairness, we—I um, think a lot of it's uh, when he does the remixes. A lot of them, a lot of people give him very detailed notes, very specific to different parts. But our attitude was, has, has always been, "No, no, you, you know, whatever you hear in there is relevant." Because you know, if we get obsessed, it'll be—we'll go back to how we thought about it. And it's like he's bring, he brings something totally different to it. And we love that. We love the fact that he brings something different to it. He doesn't. He doesn't try and mix it in a modern way. He's very kind of respectful. Only uses kind of emulations of, of the, even the effects we would have used then, you know, like the plate reverbs and you know the stuff that would have been available to us. He, he doesn't go ultra modern on it. I would probably. I'd be. I'd be kind of sacrilegious and go to hell with it. We, we're mixing it in nineteen, you know, in twenty twenty one. So it's like you know, mix with. Up, but you know he's, he doesn't do that but he, he it brings a kind of airiness and an openness to it i think but that's that's any mixer which you know, i think you know mike will know is it's someone else's ears it's nothing it, the equipment is, is secondary to you know even even when it comes to mastering or whatever it's someone else's ears and that's what you respect it's it's such a pleasure to listen to i mean it's it more than than you know having listened to the album for however many years 45 years or whatever it is um, and getting used to that sound and then to, to hear it really sounding like a performance in some ways for the first time. When I, when I yeah. think about the original mix, it's, it's, it's like a, a series of set pieces. It's, it's, it's almost like constructions. It's, it's, yeah. it's, there's something almost, uh, intimidating about how expert it is. <laughs> and it's, and it's, and it's tempting, you know, honestly, you know, from a listening standpoint and, uh, and it's tempting to think of it as you know more than than human in a way. And then when you listen to the the new version, it's just a performance. Obviously with overdubs, obviously very expert use of the studio, but you can really feel the performances more. And everyone is just on fire. You know, I, th I think that's kind of like peak studio performance period for for Del Giant in some ways. The the playing on the album is, yeah, is just you. quite unbelievable. Yeah, that, it's pretty good. I think actually, to much my ears, I think it's slightly tighter on interview. The next album, although 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 the music is, is it goes a bit more obscure, but I think I think I, I I'm just because Stephen's also he's he's kind of done um, pre preliminary mixes for interview as well, which would be coming eventually. But uh, yeah, I, and when he sent me those, I thought this band's pretty tight. You know, it's like, and I didn't I didn't feel that with uh, Freehand particularly. It felt a little bit, um, not quite under rehearsed, but there's there's certain things you might have we might have picked on picked up if we'd have played it a little bit more before the recording. I don't know. Well, I don't know if Stephen is moving things around, and I don't think he is. I don't think he's taking that much of a no, re revisionist approach, because to listen no. to the, the music, I mean, listen to it in, in with with headphones. I think some of you, honestly, some of your feeling about it is colored by the way the original mix sounds. 
which in some ways Maybe. makes the band sound loose. And like there's very many peculiar rhythms on the album where yeah, you know, it, it sounds almost like we're not quite sure where the downbeat is in the original mix. In the new mix, I'm hearing the bass and drums locking on every one of these these uh, time right. changes. And you realize, nice. no, it's not, it's not, uh, you know, loose. It's not sloppy. It's incredibly sophisticated, and, and I just couldn't hear it before. Um, I agree with you that that interview is terrifyingly tight, and and also, that's just a terrifying album because almost every song has like some real abstract, real angular thing in it, and and so that album just kind of feels like pow pow, pow and it's great. Yeah, um, yeah. But but freehand is beautiful. It's really beautiful playing and really beautiful compositions and just a beautifully paced album from start to finish. Great songs. Personally, I, I think it uh, it offers it better than we do because we only had a, um, a certain amount of time and opportunity and, and really resources to make it um, as good as Stephen has done it. But Stephen has a, a fantastic uh, ear for what Gentle Giant has done. Ray, Ray knows way better than I do, but I think the sound of uh, the remix of uh, Freehand sounds great, actually. I mean, the individual instruments are much clearer and separate, more separated. And so you can hear sort of the, the arrangements much more sort of with a clarified way, uh, to my ears anyway. I mean, I think it's I think it's better than the original. So what do I know? I'm just uh, sitting here in my study trying to get on. And I like the album too, so that's, that's even better for me. I'm always really struck when I when I listen to, to giant recordings, how um, earthy your your vocal approaches, both in the sound of the voice and also in the lyrics, and it's and it's really you know it's distinct in that way from you know other what are thought of as as progressive bands at the time. It 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 seems more grounded, more connected, and and just also the sound of your voice as a as as an ingredient in the way the the band sounds on record. It's it's and I, I'm loving that in this remix and. and I'm I'm curious about your your take on your own lyrical approach. From, from my point of view, the the big difference is when obviously when Phil's in the band, and, and they split it was split between Phil and Derek who did the lyrics. Phil was very much influenced by literature, you know, and always wanted to relate things to literature. Where Derek Derek's approach is much more abstract. It's like it came from I just ideas, and so take it away. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, Ray, Ray basically has, you know, pinpointed uh, what lyrically we, you know, we did. I mean, when Phil was working with me, we worked together and, and uh, yeah, he, he wanted to bring in some of the uh, um, lyrical content, which was based in, in literature, um, which, is, which is great. I mean, we love that too. But I think my content, if you like, it was more based on ideas about you know, feelings, politics, things were, which were, I guess, not abstract, but they were real, but they weren't, I mean, they weren't, they were certainly not Moon and June and We Love You and She Loves Me and everything else like that. It was, it was really much more based on a, a kind of reality, which was going on personally and politically and sociologically. It's, um, pretty, it's pretty acerbic. It, it you know it's it's it, it's it definitely has a, a a kind of a world weary almost uh, tone to it. Well, that was that was me as a person then, back then and even now. So you know, not quite as bad as my brother Phil. You know, Ray Ray was a great uh, peacemaker in between here, uh, but uh, nevertheless, yeah, it was it was. We, you know, you have to remember when we were in Gentle Giant. This was our second band. We had a band before that. So we were, you know, we were road weary when we started. Right. Yes. Understood. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I think that all the, the, the themes and the titles and just the, the general uh, concepts for all the songs on freehand are, are really strong, really indelible from, from start to finish. It's just a, a strong, memorable set of tunes. And, and the lyrics are, are fantastic. The vocal performances are fantastic. I just kind of wanted to have an opportunity to, to mention that. And I'm, I'm always curious about the writing process. Getting under construction years ago and hearing both of your demos, uh, you know, your, the, the, the guitar constructions that you would put together to generate ideas for songs. 
I I think on yeah. on freehand that it sounds to me like like Time to Kill is is a, a Ray or or possibly a Derek composition. Uh, yeah, that's right. That that's yeah. right. That's you. Mobile, I, I think, is yeah. you. I think I think actually mobile. I got a feeling that Derek started it, and he said, and he, he I think he'd written like a riff, and he said, Ray, do this. I said, okay then. <laughs> so I kind of, I think I think I might I think I might, I might have just taken that one over that one. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think you know. It, I, I was, you know, used my Revox 15 IPS and speeded it up to 30 IPS and, and, and said, Ray, help. <laughs> and Ray took it over and, 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 and made it kind of like a real song as, or a real riff as, as opposed to a series of notes. <laughs> I'm, I love your demos, Derek, uh, it, 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 you know, and hearing things just come out of it. I imagine that was just a very intuitive process, right? You would just start playing ideas and then layer it and, and see what happened. Oh, like all of us, I mean, I think you know, Carrie obviously is, was much more um, you know score oriented. Ray, in, in certain respects, was the same way, except that he would put it down in 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 whatever form and way he wanted. I mean, that that was the that main musical writers, and, and if I contributed a little bit, it was basically intuitive, uh, and uh, I'd usually you know drag Ray into my little pieces and say, Ray, help which he did and, and made it something which was at least worthwhile putting a re recording if not to listen to yeah and my method yeah so my method was it's the same we the only recording machine back then was the revox the two track and the, and the sound on sound you know basically you know going one channel to the other back and back and forth so um but yeah I, it's like uh when i did i just kind of improvised almost a whole tape's worth of just played and li when you listen back, something will spark and you go, oh, that's quite interesting bit. And probably the demo, by the time the demos got overdubbed, they were like extracted bits and say, oh, I'll, I'll try and do something with this. So you'd be layering, so, you'd be overdubbing on the actual originally improvised bit and... and... Or, or, take a, or, t or just take that riff from there and then do a new recording of that and then, and then try and, you know, basically go from there build it up from there hearing your your demos on under construction and then listening to time to kill which i've always loved and and right. and just the the way that the subtle architecture of that song all the bits just sliding in and out uh, of each other it's it's really fantastic architecture and and uh, and uh, but it also put me in mind of the stuff that you were doing on those demos and is is the song freehand that's character that's Carrie's, okay. Right. So yeah, you, that's Gary, yeah. you were all, you were constantly uh, uh, faced with the the uh, the task of playing Carrie's left hand on on a lot of that stuff. It, it, was, it sounded amazing, but it also meant that with more th those hocketing things, that very frequently notes aren't landing anywhere near the downbeat or just barely surrounding it. And uh, that stuff is incredible to listen to because it's syncopated, and, and you know, with John just like barreling four on the floor through it all. It's, it's an incredible yeah, sound. We, we actually didn't, I mean, we didn't uh, like uh, think of time signatures because we, we thought more, more of uh, in kind of just little themes more than anything else. And if they happened to be, they, were, they turned out to be odd time signatures, but it was really the riff that, or whatever was the, you know, it wasn't like we'll do a song in seven, you know. And, and, and of course, John's attitude was, well, you get a bar of seven, you get a bar of five, I can just play through fours, you know, and it's like, and it, It'll sound, it'll sound more syncopated, and it does, you know, so. Yeah, John really, honestly, was, if we didn't have John, it would be, it would sound, it would, it would have sounded less pleasant, I think. But John was, was almost a cornerstone in, in what we did. So, I mean, you know, incredible drummer, and, and, and he hit the snare so damn hard. My, you know, you can't see right now, but my hair's parted still in the middle from the snare beat. I mean, on stage, it was, no, he was an incredibly hard drummer, but really rocked so, you know, ridiculously well and, and gave the band um, an element which, which was, was solid and, 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 and I guess in certain respects, funky, actually. Totally. Yeah. 
And I mean, it's, it's I, 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 I loved, I loved, you know, I love all the music. I thought what Malcolm did on Three Friends was was beautiful. I think that's a really beautiful record that it kind of stands alone as as that thing. And then what John went on to do was a, a complete other thing that was so powerful and so cool and so fun. You know, it, it yeah. it's like the the thing of taking music this intricate and potentially daunting and turning it into a fun thing, which is also what I got listening to the to the freehand, the new mix. I was telling Ray before that it sounds like performances now. Same thing you were saying, as opposed to the original, where it sounds like more like studio constructions. In the in the new mix, it really sounds like a, a band performing, and I hear what just sounds like glee from the band on all over it that just like so much uh energy and it sounds like i mean were you guys really enjoying yourself during the process of recording these pieces yeah, no, I, I think it was a very happy recording actually just remember you know being particularly after you know because we'd come out of you know the kind of bad era when you know from phil leaving and then management problems and everything like that and by the time we got to freehand i think we were, we were pretty much having a good time i think I guess that's sort of the theme of the album, isn't it? Yeah, very much. Well, ask Derek. <laughs> you know, talking about you know a good time. You know, what you ask about John? John also, apart from being a great drummer, has had and still has fantastic personality on stage and 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 off stage also. So that you know, as far as um, you know, are, are enjoying ourselves. Um, one thing I don't think Jeff, the band uh, across the board, you know, per, to to a person uh, ever did was take each other or or the band seriously in, in quotes um, that we were some kind of like magical orchestra that everyone should be in awe of. We were just having a fun time on stage, and if we were able to to project that to the to the audience. That was, you know, that was great for us. I mean, we smile and look at the audience, and they'll smile back, as opposed to share, you know, shoe staring, uh, you know, uh, long passages of a Mellotron and, and thinking we were the LSO or something, you know. So that, that that differentiated the band from a lot of our sort of so-called, you know, contemporaries, if you like. One thing that um, came up in a previous interview, I think it was Ray who said, in the nineteen seventies. Gentle Giant faced difficulty in getting audiences to resonate with sophisticated arrangements. Um, but today's audience, is it more diverse or is it just more global? There's more people, more awareness. Like, why do you think um, the music is flourishing, you know, 30, 40 years later? Well, <laughs> who knows? I, who know? I don't know. I, I'm always surprised that people be even interested. So. It's, uh, I, I, I can, I can, I think that, well, you know, the, the, I think part of the reason obviously is the ability for a lot of people to hear the music for the very first time and young, young audiences who, who weren't even born when we broke up, um, are discovering the music through the social media, uh, outlets, you know, the YouTubes and the, uh, Instagrams and, you know, not TikTok yet, but, you know, thankfully, but, um, <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, but Facebook and everything else, and um, and you know I, I I don't want to sound pompous, but you know Ray will smack me on the head if I if I try and but you know, I think we were pretty authentic. We weren't trying to be or follow someone else. We were just being ourselves, and I think that resonates to a, a, a fairly decent sized niche worldwide. I think there's a lot of stuff out there that. Um, that is basically programmed on a computer or, or whatever, and, and, and it's computerized. And, that, and again, I'm not going to say it's good or bad, but it's, you know, it, it is what it is. And, but we were, we, we didn't have any computers. We just had reboxes, as Ray said, and, 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 and our instruments. And, um, <clears throat> and I think that has resonated and has the reason why it's flourished is because it's been, a, been able to be discovered by, a new generation and other generations from there, and then therefore it's um, become it's, it's 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 held up, and I think it's even flourished because of that, because it's because it's not so, like something else. It's it. I'm going to say unique in certain respects. I, it is definitely unique, and I'm a. I mean, I'm a what an example of the generational passing down of the music. You know, my father 
saw you guys live. I'm almost 40, so I never got to see you live. Um, but the, the music has meant so much to me, and I know a lot of younger people who are getting into it because their, their dad had it in their record collection, or I found it on Spotify when I was listening to this crazy ELP thing or whatever, you know, I, I think it's really cool to see, uh, I just wish there was like an opportunity for bands to perform this music. I mean, there's always opportunity, but it's so hard <laughs> what you guys did. It's like impossible to replicate. <laughs> but, it, it, but I mean, if you, if, you, if you think to back when we, when we were active, the, the amount of, uh, well, I mean, basically radio play was kind of non-existent unless you, you know, or, you know, that's why record companies push you towards trying to put, do singles. And of course we were never orientated towards singles. Uh, kind of, you know, there was AOR radio, but then there again, that was quite limited and our stuff would probably be late night. So just the, just the exposure as far as media go, just, it was nowhere, it's nothing. I mean, nowadays everything's available everywhere. Well, our exposure was basically playing yeah, playing our exposure was basically playing to an audience, and that's what we did. We we gained our fans by by playing by touring, and and you know and made and made a decent living. I mean, you know, the, we weren't ELP or yes, but certainly we were in certain areas. We were you know had a a really good following in, in Europe, you know, Italy and, and Germany and and and, uh, and Canada was a very very big uh, uh, market for the band. Um, you know, so we were able to tour and, and have a fan base that would come to see us and, and, and we were able to pay our bills and, and put bread on the table for, you know, for the period of time. So that was the, that was our exposure, as Ray said, I mean, it wasn't radio or, or, or social media or anyone, uh, you know, or any sort of tastemaker saying, well, look at this, you know, so really is our fan base. You know, speaking of social media, Derek, there's a quote of yours that I have used many times over the years. I'm, I've spent 20 years in the software development industry. And uh, at some point you said, musicians are no longer, no longer the celebrities in the music industry. Computer programmers are. I'd love to hear kind of where your thoughts are on um, streaming and Spotify and, you know, the role of computers in sharing the music, because obviously, you know, people are hearing about Gentle Giant, but you also have record executive experience. I'd love to hear your current thoughts on, you know, streaming and social. Ray, you, you want to answer that first? Well, I mean, I don't think, uh, I don't think people get a fair share of what's, you know, the kind of revenue as far as that goes. I mean, it doesn't really it doesn't really affect us because I think our, I, I, you know, streaming is probably the least of our exposure. People actually still buy the physical products we put out. Um, it's just it's just in the nature of our kind of era of band, you know. Um, but how how a modern, you know, how, how people it's like basically groups of people get together in exactly the same way as they always have. They meet at school. They have, you know, the same interests. They, they form a group. That will never change, but it's and then obviously and then kids have to be so much more savvy about getting their stuff out there. We never we never even thought about anything like that. It was always like you know get signed by a record company, they'll do the they'll do a job for us, and it's just, uh, it's just a, a totally different world. I, I'm not sure. I, I perhaps we would have you know perhaps if we, if we came out in this area, we'd be exactly the same. We'd be. You know, one of some one of us would be savvy enough to kind of you know. Well, I guess Derek, Derek and, and Derek was always ambitious, and and Phil was always ambitious enough that you know that kind of carried the a lot of the weight too. So, you know, you, know, you ask how how we feel about it. I mean, the, you know, the yeah, we shrug. I mean, I shrug anyway and say, listen, this is what it is, and 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 you can't you you can't fight progress and it is whatever what is happening is is, is progress on on whatever fronts i mean but i don't think that um to be honest and i was speaking to a producer yesterday you know well-known very well-known guy and we were chatting about um today's um you know music and and there and, and basically the uh, it's about production and presentation um and 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 entertainment which is Again, it's not, nothing wrong with it, but 
Um, I don't think we would have fit, fit in today, today's world at all. Um, so, but as far as streaming and, and uh, all that other stuff is concerned, um, what it's done is diluted any kind of um, uh, gate, gatekeeping, I guess. And it's much, much, much harder to really um, find out who is really good and who is not really good. Because, you know, it's, it's now, as opposed to YouTube and, and Facebook, now it's TikTok. And if you're not good in TikTok in five seconds, then you're not good at all. And, and, and those TikTok stars, you know, I, God knows how long they'll last. But honestly, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm going to sound like an old curmudgeon, um, but, which I am, by the way. Um, the, I don't think there's too many, a handful of artists in the last 15 to 20 years that will, you'll look back in 100 years or 50 years or whatever it is and say, wow, they were really like the, the leaders of, of classic music. I'm not sure I totally agree with that. Well, I mean, you, you, you know, we, 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 we argue amongst ourselves. You know, I, I'm not saying that there aren't you know, leaders in, I mean, I think, I think you know, in the same way as Ray, probably in certain respects, that some of the hip hop world uh, is, you know, well, I'm, 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 I'm not, uh, Ray, Ray has a diverse of opinion, which is good, actually, because that's how we work. Uh, but I, I, I'm not very, I, I don't think that having um, a formula on a, on a machine, uh, which a lot of producers do, and they fit in their artists into that formula, and those formula, formulaic, um, um, scientifically based formulas become the popular songs that are hits right now. I mean, I'm amazed, to tell you the truth, and this is me just being in the, the other side of the business, how little... Um, musical content are in the big hits right now. There's no, there's no choruses. There's no B sections. It's all about, it's all about the riff and the song. And, and the, there's ten no, there's choruses. That's the nature of them. It's, it's all about the five second chorus that starts, starts up. Well, I, look, I, I tend to disagree, but I mean, I, I was listening to a couple of uh, artists on, on the Grammy thing, and, and I, I was, you know, they're well known, and I, do, I don't know most of them from the whole of them all, to be honest with you. But I was listening to the music and I was thinking, well, what, where's the song? You know, but people who listen to General Giant say the same thing, of course. <laughs> Which is, we, we, we're much more oblique. Um, but that's my opinion. And, and Ray, can you give your opinion, please? Who, uh, you know, more modern artists that you're listening to and, and uh, you know, uh, counterpoint? <laughs> well, that, no. It, it, it's not really, it's like, I mean, I listen to, you know, all different stuff. There's no no particular one, you know, I like a lot of hip-hop music because I like the arrangements, I like what they do, I like the beats. The, are you familiar with Flying Lotus? I'm not, I know. No. He's a, a phenomenal producer, uh, musician. Uh, right. I, I think his uh, he was related uh, to, to Alice Coltrane and, and some of that has, has you know, right. trickled down yeah. into what he does. Huge right. fan of Gentle Giant. And, uh, yeah. and, and, yeah. and that's funny enough. We, we've been sampled by hip hop uh, acts as well. It's like, uh, which is uh, pretty nice. It's. Yeah, I, I think fact, the um, reason to go back to what Anthony was asking: Why does the music have any kind of life forty years later? Um, it's just. It's. It's. It's incredibly. Uh, it's badass. The, the the fact that this this music, which is so uh, you know filled with so much content and is, is so you know daunting in some ways, is executed. With with such calmness and and such confidence, it, it doesn't come across as as blustery. It's unpretentious, you know. That's what that's what makes it cool. It's filled with all the content you could possibly want. And there's a huge subculture of young players, you know. You've seen these these people on YouTube. It's just ridiculous the amount of facility, uh, you know, and and the great respect amongst you know. It's always been this way. It's a smaller subset of music fans, you know, compared to the people yeah. who are buying. The, the the top 40 or the top three or whatever um but there are the reason why your music is is enduring is because there's always going to be people who really respect and you know get off on hearing music of of great intricacy uh executed uh with confidence and and and, and general giant is like exemplary uh, example of that i think 
Yeah, just to, just to uh, um, carry off on what Ray said, um, it's interesting for me that the the hip hop world, um, as, you know, we had we've been sampled quite you know substantially by some interesting. You know, I, I think that you're right, uh, right? Interesting people who have an interest in kind of oblique music. Um, for instance, in the last year or a year and a half. Gentle Giants been sampled on three number one albums, uh, and you know, and and Run Run the Jewels in particular. Um, they had the the their song. I can't remember what it's called, but it was you know, it was the lead song on Black Panther, um, and, and they sampled Knots. Um, Common has sampled um, I can't remember which one, and and Tribe Called Quest. But this world has been very interested in our band, and I went you know went to see. Uh, uh, in fact. When I, I went backstage um, uh, because of my other side of the business with uh, Anne Wilson of, of, uh, of, of um, Heart, and um, that was a couple of years ago, and the Roots guys were there, you know, Amir, you know, the Quest Love and everything else, and uh, it's just as a sidebar here. Um, and when I went backstage, I mean, poor Anne Wilson was supposed to sing with them, and they came towards me and said, "Man, are you Derek?" And, and they loved Gentle Giant. I said, "Carrie and Ray, and wow, wow!" And they were taking pictures and asking for my autograph. I just heard them doing album. Advent of Panarch, the the Roots playing Advent. Look at my friends on on uh, on the Jimmy Fallon show. Have you heard this? No, I didn't. Yeah, they, they actually did, did the "Look at My Friends" section of Advent of Panarch as as play-in music for for somebody on the on the Fallon show. I can't even remember who. So they've been very open about that. No, so it's it's, it's just interesting that that world has um, a lot more interest in interesting music. I mean, King Crimson, of course, with J. You know, we all, we all know the biggest. But it's interesting that that world has has a, a, a very interesting. Uh, aspect about what is good and what's not, if you like. But you're right about that. It's about production and presentation. But but the more creative producers find ways to to layer all kinds of interesting things. It's it, you need the driving. You need a groove, right? And it's kind of always been that way. Yeah. And and now it's just the the beat that people respond to is very different from the beat from from 40 years ago. But over that beat, you can get away with a lot sonically. I mean. To Pimp a Butterfly by, by Kendrick Lamar, to listen to that album in yeah. headphones, yeah. it's like listening to yeah. We're Only In It For The Money or something. It's, it's, it's so layered. There's, yeah. there's so much going on, and it's so sophisticated. Yeah. It's incredible. It's it, 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 it also his jazz influence. It's just incredible. Yeah, and Thundercat yeah. on bass, who's yeah. one of the most phenomenal musicians exactly, on the yeah. planet. And, yeah. and uh, there's, yeah. there, there's a lot going on. <laughs> yeah. That's, I mean, that's why I never, you know, I've never, ever... You know, because it's not like it's, they're not as good as our day, because that's just like, totally not true. They, you know, they're equally as good, if not better. And, and, and also, kind of virtuosity always gets better. It's like, you know, modern musicians are incredibly accomplished, much, much more so than in our day. I mean, you, you think, you think really? back on the first time you heard Eddie Van Halen and you think you can't do that. You know, you can't do that on a guitar. What, what's going on? And now that's just, exactly. that's in the water supply. Every kid can do that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. They learned that at rock school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So um, I don't want to eat up too much of your time, but um, I'd like to get some maybe rapid fire questions. Um, yeah, Ray, your bass tone on this album is unbelievable. Um, um, do you just plug straight into the amp with the Fender bass? Is that it? That's pretty much it. Yeah, there's always a DI as well, but you know, it's, just, it's usually a bit of both. Okay, and then um, so you mentioned interview remixes uh, potentially, you know, sometime in the future. Are is is that it after, or are you, is interview the last one as far as you know right now? No, we, he's also done preliminaries on the, the missing piece. Oh, very okay. eager to hear that. That, that, that that's an album yeah. that will benefit from a from a new mix, I think. Yeah, it does. I know that, that it's not Ray's favorite album, but I like the album a lot personally. We just got the rights back to Civilian. Um, I think I like this album. You know, there's a lot of fans out there that said, ah, "Poo poo, it's not the same thing." You know, this is a different different band. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, we're not playing nine four or, or you know thirteen seven or whatever. But 
but I think it's a really good rock album. So, sorry, you know, and, I, and I, uh, one of my favorite tracks of Gentle Giant, this is me, not probably the rest of the guys, is Inside Out. I think it's, I think it's great. Um, and we've, we have that, so we're going to be putting that out uh, this year. Um, I don't like that album, but it's, it's, it's actually more my no, it's only because it's more my participation in how things were at the time. I, I think rather, that, rather that's, than that's a, it was a really uh, weird uh, time to, to record and, and a weird place, and that's probably affected your, your, your razor kind of like outlook about. I mean, it's just, I mean there's there are certain albums. I mean, for instance, the missing piece um, we recorded in Holland. I hated being there. I mean, it was awful personally for me. For a you know, it's probably. It was better, but I just hated yeah, being in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it was what Hill Valley, right? yeah, Hill Valley, yeah. Ooh, yeah, it was awful. For, I, I hated being being out in the middle of the, nowhere in, in in Holland. God, it was. I couldn't get back quick enough. All right, and uh, gentle giant friend uh, Dan Bornmark wanted to know who wrote the melody to "Time to Kill." I, I'm just trying. It to could be me, me and Carrie. I think right. right? I think I, don't know. I think I, I think I write, I write some of the melodies as part of the arrangement, but then they get because well, obviously their lyrics come as well. Then they get kind of extrapolated. Um, they kind of get. But that, I think that was a combo, right? Wasn't it? Yeah. That one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I can't remember. Too long ago. It seems to be a collaboration. Uh, that, that's the consensus, I think. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, is there going to be another sort of fan collaboration video? We don't have any, any plans. Okay. Do you, do you guys listen to the 5.1 mixes or, you know, are you equipped to do such a thing? <laughs> that's Ray's job. Not if I can help it. No. <laughs> Well, in fact, the, uh, uh, now on, on on the Blu-ray, um, Stephen has done an Atmos mix on this one as well on freehand. So I, I haven't heard, I haven't heard that yet because I don't have an Atmos set up. So uh, that it'd be interesting. Yeah, I have a five point one. I think it's I, I think it's great. I mean, I, I you know the uh, Power and the Glory sounded great to me. I mean, I, cool. you know, So I haven't heard uh, this this one yet. But um, uh, well, is there a possibility of isolated instrumental uh, versions of any of the songs? Uh, well, there are there are on the Blu-ray the, the, the a complete set of instrumentals. Oh, excellent! I must have missed that on the Blu-ray. That that was on Power and the Glory as, as well. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, what what are the formats, Ray? Uh, Ray? Well, Atmos five point one original, uh, you know, new stereo, original stereo, original quad, which 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 is actually quite adventurous as well. But but you know, I remember doing it down at Advin with with the one pan pot. Well, I was just remembering. In particular, the, the the song on reflection, and I was always fascinated with with uh, your guys' live arrangements. The the facts that the fact that things would change so much by the by the time you were touring them, and uh, and I re I remembered uh, listening to that live version of on reflection uh, on the live album when it first came out. And the first time hearing it, it starts with that chamber music piece, and thinking. Oh well, I, I I guess that doing that vocal thing at the beginning is is too is too challenging to to pull off on stage, and then you do it. <laughs> it just comes second in the arrangement after the chamber thing. Then you yeah. do yeah. the vocal thing and yeah. playing at the same time. I, I I did see you live in in seventy seven, and and I remember specifically Ray you playing the violin and singing the part at the same time, having a a, a oh, big right. impact. Um, but yeah. I was curious about the process of of you know changing up songs for a live performance and in the case of on reflection it's a complete other entirely ambitious arrangement so like that that chamber piece at the beginning would that be just a, a written arrangement that that carrie would bring and some of it yeah but some of it just came, out, came out of rehearsal as well just like you know find out what works and then and then it would even adapt over a few gigs sometimes you know when, when, if, if kind of parts fell flat we kind of, you know, rework a little bit. Yeah, I think that, you know, really, in certain respects, uh, the, the, the album versions, you know, I've said this before, but, you know, the album versions of, of the songs that we've recorded were kind of like sketches for this uh, stage show. And the stage show, we, we'd present them in a kind of a completely different way. So we were on an album, it was just for the music that hopefully people would, would like and enjoy and buy. On stage, we were performing and, and Hopefully entertaining. So, to do that, we had to. We we like to. 
I like to show off, I guess. <laughs> uh, and and um, so we showed off and, and said, okay, we can do this. Uh, you know, if you don't like it, you can boo, but that's okay. Um, uh, but yeah, we, you know, we were, you know, we, we were able to do it, so we did it. You know, so we, we changed up things and, and made things, you know, excerpts of various songs. And, 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 and again, it was almost like a sketch for the, for the, the, the painting for the stage. Uh, for, you know, the, the, the music itself on the, on the album was a, a sketch for the painting for the stage, a stage uh, audience. That's beautiful. And it was, it was wonderful from an audience standpoint to get something. It felt generous of the band to, to come up with an experience that was, that was unique from the album as opposed to getting carbon copies of what's on the album. Yeah, I, I just remember, you know, we, we had to be careful about tripping over wires. And, and when we you know, changed instruments, and, you know, Ray would hand me the bass and I'd trip over it, you know, plug it in and, and at least we'd pick up the violin or, or the trumpet or whatever. It was quite primitive back then. Yeah, there was no wireless then. It was like, okay, God, I hope I can plug it in in time so I can get, come in on time. Was it, were you able to hear very well on stage? Was, were the monitoring systems uh, sufficient for you to get everything that was going on? They were just kind of wedge monitors most of the time. And, and it depending with, whether we actually even had control of it. Obviously, when, when, when we first started, we were kind of the support act. It was almost like you can't have any monitoring type thing, you know, from, the, from whatever band was uh, headlining. Yeah. So a, lot, a lot of winging it, yeah. a lot, a lot of uh, you know head nodding, and uh, you know now you know to, to to whoever it is, you know Gary or John or uh, Carrie or, or Ray, but you know the monitors were there. Some you know when we were headlining, of course, but there's you know wedge monitors, not earpieces or or wireless. Well, it's a, it's a testimony to how well rehearsed and well prepared you were that you could you know you play that music just on visual. <laughs> We, 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 you know, I mean, Ray, don't you agree? I, we really, um, our rehearsals were pretty intense. I mean, you know, no one liked it, but we, we made sure that we rehearsed. Yeah, yeah, no, we pretty, pretty hard before we went out there. Yeah, no, we did. We're, you know, we're hard workers. <laughs>